In this lesson, we're going to discuss malware. Malware is software that's designed to infiltrate and possibly damage a computer system without the owner's knowledge or consent. Some malware even takes control of the computer system. So let's take a look at different types of malware and what they can do. First, let's look at viruses. A virus is a string of code that's attached to a file and spreads to other files. Viruses have three key characteristics, a replication mechanism, an activation mechanism, and an objective. Viruses are actually very difficult to nail down. They're very stealthy in nature, and they come in many different forms, so it's hard to identify them. For example, a stealth virus helps to avoid detection by masking itself. It may, for example, attempt to attach itself to the boot section of your hard drive in order to hide there. You could also have a macro virus. A macro virus exploits applications such as Microsoft Office that use macros. A macro is really just a miniature program that's designed to help automate repetitive functions within an application like Microsoft Word. A macro virus can take advantage of this feature and embed itself into a Word file. Then, when that file is opened and the macro is activated, it runs. It could then potentially cause significant damage and spread itself to other machines. For example, it could set itself as an attachment to all the addresses in a user's email address book. A polymorphic virus can change form to avoid detection. It can actually mutate its code. A retrovirus, on the other hand, attacks the antivirus software that's installed on the system and tries to disable it. Another type of virus is an armored virus, which makes itself difficult to detect by covering itself with a protective code. There's also a companion virus. This computer virus attaches itself to some legitimate program. Then it creates a second program with a different file name extension. When users try to run the legitimate program, the companion virus activates and executes the second program instead of the legitimate one. The most effective way to prevent a computer virus from spreading throughout your network is to install anti-malware software on your system and then to configure it to run regular scans. When you do this, be sure to scan the entire system, including removable storage, such as your external USB drive and all of your email attachments. However, be aware that scanning only detects malware after it has infected your system. In order to prevent infections in the first place, you should actually enable real-time protection in your anti-malware software. Real-time protection will alert you when it detects malware attempting to install itself on your system. Essentially, Real-time protection tries to block the malware before it actually infects the system. Now, let's talk about another type of malware called worms. A worm is a type of malicious software that travels across computer networks, automatically replicating itself. Unlike a virus, a worm can propagate itself without a file. Worms are cause for concern because they can spread throughout the internet to millions of unprotected computers very, very rapidly. In order to do this, worms usually take advantage of unpatched vulnerabilities in computer systems. So to avoid a worm infection, you need to make sure that your systems have been patched and have anti-malware software installed. There's also Trojan horse malware. A Trojan is particularly sneaky. It's named after the Trojan horse from Greek mythology. A Trojan appears to be some type of benign software, such as a game, but it's not. A Trojan contains malicious code embedded within an apparently useful application. A user may download and install a Trojan and then use it for legitimate purposes, unaware that he just installed malware on his system. Trojans do not self-replicate like worms do, and they don't attach to a file like a virus. Instead, they just rely on the unwitting user to manually download and install them. After they're installed, Trojans can cause a lot of damage. For example, a Trojan could create a backdoor in the system to establish communications with the attacker who created the Trojan in the first place, and that could allow the attacker to remotely control the infected machine. A computer infected with a Trojan could potentially become what we call a zombie. In this state, the attacker can remotely control the infected computer from their own computer, which is known as the zombie master. The zombie computer is sometimes referred to as a bot, so if you hear the term botnet, we're talking about a network of computers that have been infected with the same Trojan. Botnets are controlled by the infrastructure that's created by the zombie master, which is also called the bot herder. A zombie master could use the botnet for spamming. It could use it for committing click fraud. It could be used to perform a distributed denial of service attack and many other types of exploits. To discover this type of malware, you can examine your computer's firewall log to see if it's been acting as a zombie. In the log, you should see the outbound traffic from the zombie 
going through the firewall to the zombie master. In addition, you need to install an anti-malware system. It should be able to detect a Trojan. Next, we need to look at rootkits. Rootkits are a particularly insidious type of malware. Rootkits are installed within the boot sector of the infected computer's hard drive. As such, the BIOS of that computer system actually boots from the rootkit, thinking that the rootkit is actually an operating system like Microsoft Windows. The rootkit code is then loaded into memory, and the rootkit itself loads the legitimate operating system. Because the rootkit was loaded before the operating system was booted, the rootkit is completely invisible to most anti-malware scanners. They are very, very difficult to detect. There are two different strategies that you can use to prevent rootkit infection. The first one is to install anti-rootkit software. However, a better solution is to actually upgrade to a computer system that uses UEFI firmware instead of the traditional BIOS. This is really cool because the UEFI infrastructure requires an operating system to be digitally signed before it's booted. It's totally designed to prevent rootkits from being booted. On newer versions of Windows, this is done using the secure boot feature. Let's talk about another type of malware called a logic bomb. A logic bomb is malicious code that's designed to execute only after certain predefined conditions are met. The malware lays dormant until these conditions occur, then it executes. For example, it's common for a logic bomb to wait until a certain date and time is reached before it executes. Other logic bombs may wait until the user opens a specific application or file. Logic bomb effects can range from benign to malicious in nature. Next, let's look at spyware. Spyware is software that gets installed on a system without the user's consent or knowledge, and it's very insidious. It's designed to intercept data or even assume partial control over the computer. As its name implies, spyware is designed to collect personal information about the user, such as their internet surfing habits. It may even capture their website password. Spyware generally uses some type of tracking cookie to collect and then report on a user's activities. Spyware may also install additional software. It may change computer settings, or it may redirect the web browser to unwanted websites. Related to spyware is another type of malware called adware. Adware automatically plays, displays, or downloads advertisements to the user's computer. In fact, adware commonly incorporates the same functions as most spyware packs. Both types of malware invade the user's privacy. Adware usually spies on your web activity and then displays advertisements based on your browsing history. Your best defense against spyware and adware are a pop-up blocker and anti-malware software. You should also be familiar with Crimeware. Crimeware is designed to perpetrate identity theft by accessing user accounts with online retailers and financial institutions like PayPal or maybe an online banking site. The attacker uses the data gathered by the Crimeware to remove funds from those accounts or make unauthorized transactions. Crimeware often employs keyloggers to capture usernames and passwords for these types of sites as the user logs in, and then will use them to create the exploit. All of these exploits are pretty nasty. Ransomware is a little different. In this case, an attacker acquires your personal data using malicious software and holds that data until you pay the requested ransom. This attack is sometimes attempted on large enterprises with confidential information that can't be leaked to the public. Some companies will pay millions of dollars to avoid an information leak. Ransomware can also be used to avoid user access to data until the ransom is paid. Here, the malware uses a technique that encrypts the stolen files, making them inaccessible to the owner. The attacker decrypts the files only after the ransom is paid. Fortunately, there are several key things you can do to prevent yourself from falling victim to malicious software. First, make sure that you use the latest version or patch for your web browser. Second, install the latest operating system updates for your system. Then, install anti-malware software on every single computer system in your network. But be aware that not all anti-malware software is equally effective. One thing you can do is to use a search engine, such as Google, to view the latest anti-malware rankings to determine which package is the most effective one you could use. After you've selected and installed an anti-malware package, be sure you keep its definitions database constantly updated and also configure it to run regular scans of your file system. You should also enable real-time protection to block infections before they actually occur. If an anti-malware scan actually detects malicious software in your system, you should always either quarantine it or delete it. 
You should also protect each computer on your network with host-based firewall software. This prevents malicious hosts on the internet from establishing unauthorized connections with your computer. You should also use a pop-up blocker to prevent adware. Most web browsers provide pop-up blocking functionality that you just have to enable. You should also carefully manage the cookies on your system. Some cookies are useful, but others can be really risky. Most web browsers allow you to specify which types of cookies you want to allow and block. Finally, you should consider switching to a newer computer system that uses UEFI firmware instead of the traditional BIOS in order to prevent rootkit infection. That's it for this lesson. In this lesson, you were introduced to malware. We talked about some of the types of malware that you might encounter, and we discussed the measures you can take to block or repair malware infections.